welcome. Welcome to our sixth annual Festival of Ideas. Yes. I don't think so. I am Megan Salazar, the coordinator and also an art teacher here at Liberty Common High School. First of all, a couple of announcements. Host teachers and high school teacher presenters, please remember to take a photo or video of the audience of the talk you are hosting or giving. This is necessary for contact tracing. An announcement for everyone else included, please refer to your confirmation email in order to only attend the talks you've registered for. We simply need to avoid overcrowding the rooms. There, there is, um, oh yeah, so take, take note of the locations of the talks in your program as many of the teacher presenters have been relocated to the math and history wings so they're not in their home rooms. And you can refer to the maps we printed for you to find where they are. For the last bit of housekeeping, uh, do keep in mind that two of our presentations have unfortunately been canceled the talk by Nick Weeks in session two and the talk by Andrew Wallace in session three. So if you were signed up for one of those talks, we uh, simply ask that you find another place to wiggle your way into um, as best you can find another talk. There's plenty of other talks. We have just such a wonderful um, array of speakers offered today. Next, I must acknowledge our extensive crew that came together to make today happen. It's grown to too many people to list individually here. Um, and I, I simply feel so blessed, especially be, by our IT and custodial crew who have just conducted some heroics to help me put this together today. Yeah. To all of you who volunteered your time and effort, know you have my deepest gratitude. I want to thank all of our speakers. We are deep, deeply honored to have you with us. You have formed an incredible lineup for our fortunate audience. We also have our donors to thank for breakfast, lunch, and snacks throughout the day served in the Stoa and Great Hall. And any further donations, if you are interested, are greatly appreciated. I will have some information um, posted in the Great Hall during lunch on that. Now to take a moment to give you some context for your day. You may not be aware that Festival of Ideas is a part of a greater movement, a movement to celebrate learning for leisure. We were inspired to form this colloquium by Ridgeview Classical's Humanities Day. Later, our colleagues down at Loveland Classical Schools inaugurated their always impressive symposium, which make, made us really step up our game. By the way, be on the lookout for that event in the spring, and there's information on that event in your program. Finally, we encountered the Institute for Classical Education originated by Great Hearts Academy in Phoenix, also noted in your program. They are an organization who hold conferences for classical educators to, be, to come and be enriched. Being involved with them allowed us to expand our network and include world-class speakers like the keynote we have today. And this institute has become our greatest supporter. We have journeyed far to make this event what it is today. Additionally, we have been trudging our way along our own personal journeys through this pandemic world. In honor of how far we all have come and how far we all have left to go, I feel that today it would be most fitting to embrace the theme of that of the pilgrim. Not only will our keynote address be centered around the author, Annie Dillard, but it is also the 700th anniversary of Dante's death. And both of these great authors famously called themselves 
pilgrims. I challenge you today to consider yourself as a pilgrim, a traveler in search of something precious and sacred. In our case, we are seeking understanding and enlightenment, which leads to the ability to discern the true, the good, the beautiful. As our headmaster, Bob Schaefer, put so nicely into a prayer that I, he recently shared, he wished for us today, let us be transformed. And if you are a student here today, the best part of this transformative educational pilgrimage is that you will not be graded on any of it. <laughs> and so enjoy that. Revel in that. Finally, I would like to introduce you to your first guide on this learning adventure upon which we now embark. Jonathan Gregg. He is a visiting assistant professor of education at Hillsdale College, regularly teaching classes, including the classical quadrivium, mathematics and deductive reasoning, logic and rhetoric, and teaching secondary mathematics. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics and English from his Hillsdale College, a Master's of Arts in Humanities from University of Chicago, and he is currently pursuing a PhD in Mathematics Education from Michigan State University. Previously, as he served a, as an Assistant Director of Hillsdale College's Barney Charter School Initiative, he also taught middle and high school mathematics in the Great Hearts Charter School system. His research, interests center, his research interests center around the teaching and learning of mathematics in classical schools, Socratic pe pedagogy, Singapore mathematics, the educational philosophy of Martin Buber, and the classical quadrivium. He lives in Hillsdale with his wife, Casey, and their two children, Eliana, of four years old, and Simeon, of two. And now, please welcome. Mr. Jonathan Gregg. I'm taller than Mrs. Salazar. Well, as far as, as, far as pilgrimage guides go, uh, I don't think I'm either as good looking or as eloquent as Beatrice for Dante, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot here. Um, it is just an absolute honor to be here with you all. These, uh, events like this are so important to, um, to furthering classical education and to sharing ideas and to, and to just developing a kind of community oriented around the best things. And I, I could not be more thrilled to, to speak with you guys today. It is, um, it is, it is truly an honor. Um, uh, I've titled this talk rather ambitiously, perhaps, I am the arrow shaft, Annie Dillard seeing and classical pedagogy. But I'm actually not going to start with Annie Dillard at all. I want to start with a quote that has captivated me for a few years, and I think it's at the absolute heart of what we mean when we say, either students, I go to a classical school, or teachers, I teach at a classical school, or school leaders, I am the school leader of a classical school. I'm, I'm quite literally haunted by this quote. Um, although now that I'm kind of reading that out loud, like uh, I don't know if kind of being haunted is, is, is can, you be ha can you be haunted by something in a good way? Uh, it, it, it does kind of like follow me around and I think about it all the time and uh, even when I'm not supposed to be thinking about it, I, maybe, maybe, haunted, maybe haunted is right, uh, but, but haunted in a good way. Um, and, and it's the beginning of a little known treatise of Augustine's called On Order, uh, which he wrote immediately after his conversion to Christianity, even before he wrote the Confessions, and he makes this claim, and I think this is almost unthinkable in today's academic climate. Here it is. Uh, this is Augustine. It goes like this. There is an order to be found within things and between them which binds and directs this world to attain and retain this order, to open one's eyes and other people's to it 
is difficult and very uncommon. Let me, let me actually read that one more time, uh, just because I think it's that fundamental. There is an order to be found within things and between them which binds and directs this world. To attain and retain that order, to open one, one's eyes and other people's to it, is difficult and very uncommon. Uh, and if you'll indulge me, before we dive into Annie Dillard, I want to spend a few minutes unpacking that phrase by phrase, because I, in some ways I truly believe that this is the whole ballgame. Either we stand with Augustine on this, or we don't. Um, and, and really, I think we have to stand with him. First, Augustine is making a claim about some kind of order. Right? Um, and while his definition of order is not immediately apparent at the outset of his treatise, perhaps the best picture of what he has in mind is the notion of the musica mundana, the harmony of the spheres seen throughout ancient and medieval philosophy. It's inaudible to the human ear, this music can be thought of as the unifying force to which everything in the world resonates. The, ryth the rhythmic and harmonious pattern that under undergirds all being and motion. The secret timber of the cosmos. For Augustine, then, the order in the world is a mysterious universal blueprint woven in and through all life to which each individual entity contributes and from which each entity draws its structure, its purpose, and its animation. It is the beat to which we all march. And though it in no way diminishes the freedom of the will, it underlies all thought and action. A subterranean pattern that provides an unshakable foundation for everything and everyone. Lewis would call this the deeper magic from the dawn of time. Though there may be uncertainty, chaos, suffering, etc., beneath it all, somehow, some way, is an infinitely deep order that undergirds our universe. What a claim. There is an order. But it is, it is not the identification of such an order that makes Augustine's claim so radically important to today's world. Rather, it's his depiction of the vastness of its reach and the breadth of its scope. Consider briefly the implications of his description as he continues. First, notice here, there is an order to be found. Amazingly, this deeper magic is in some way findable. Rather than be content with hinting at an order that's transcendental, unattainable, shrouded in mystery, Augustine posits an accessible order, something that can be sought and potentially found by human beings. And not only is it possible to catch a glimpse of the order of the cosmos, but the pursuit of such a vision is woven into the very purpose of humanity. It is to be found. It requires a response from us. This findability does not eliminate the mystery of the Musica Mundana, nor does it suggest that it can ever be completely understood or mastered by humans, but it does imply a certain approachability in the here and now. Next, this order is within things. That means that each thing, from the largest cosmological body to the smallest molecule, has an inherent order, containing within them something that resonates to this larger pattern. While for Augustine, this order certainly has its ultimate source in the divine, the picture here is not primarily of an external force imposing his will on the world like some kind of cosmic disciplinarian. Rather, this order is internal. It's ontological. It's woven into the very being of things. Put another way, Augustine is implying the notion of a musica humana, an interior human music that resonates to the music of the cosmos, uniting body and soul. And on a personal level, it is within you, within me, within those sitting around you, within us all. Moving on, not, not only is this order within things, but it is between them. This is a relational claim, referring to the order present in interaction and in relationship. Consider every one of the interconnected web of associations this world is made up of, between people and other people, between things in nature, between people and objects, between everything, order must be found in all of those relationships. Relationships are complex, they are nuanced, they are messy, they are chaotic. But for Augustine, it's not just that I have order in me and that you have order in you, but in this moment, in my speaking and you listening, in our encounter, in the space between, this order crackles. It sparks as we approach one ordered soul to another ordered soul. But, okay, what does this order do? All right, let's continue. The, the, the order binds the world. Binds is a little bit ambiguous at times, and while Augustine would not necessarily be opposed to the sort of compulsory 
connotations that go along with the word binds. I think the main sense Augustine is intending here is the idea of uniting. This makes sense. If it truly is something we all share, it must necessarily be the thing that brings us all together under its umbrella. There's a reason why people bond in community, why we have come together today instead of spending our Saturday on the couch alone, why we value the chance to converse, and it is that we all share something that binds us together with an irresistible force. This order is the music to the dance of life, and that dance is not a solo endeavor. It's something done with one another. Finally, this order directs the world. It's involved in action. And while, again, I don't think we see anything here that might minimize the freedom of the will, it does seem like this order provides a structure that frames our actions. I think the conductor of a symphony or the director of a play is a particularly apt analogy here, providing the pattern and tempo and guidance for the action and weaving it together into a seamless whole. Rather than stifle the individual creativity of the performers, the director makes the music of life, makes the music come to life, allowing for a more thorough and complete brilliance that participates in and contributes in something higher and greater than oneself. Uh, there's a great moment in uh, Tolkien's creation myth, the Ainu Lindale, that helps me to think about this. In the myth, the celestial beings create through song. And Iluvatar, the godlike figure, proposes a theme of music, and each of the celestial beings sing according to the theme, but also interweaving their own music as well. And during this singing, creating, uh, there are a few celestial beings, Melkor being the most egregious offender, that try to sing contrary to the theme of Iluvatar. But at the end, when Iluvatar shows them the creation they made with the song, Tolkien writes the following. It says, And Iluvatar said again, Behold your music, this is your minstrelsy, and each of you shall find contained therein, amid the design that I set before you, all those things which it may seem that he himself devised or added. And even thou, Melkor, will discover all the secret thoughts of thy mind, and will perceive that they are but a part of the whole, and tributary to its glory." beautifully put. I think this is actually pretty close to Augustine's idea of the order of the world. A deep pattern woven in and through life, something holistic that each individual moment contributes to in some mysterious way. Don't miss how radical of a claim this is. All the trends around us in the world are swimming in the opposite direction, especially in academia, especially in education. The entirety of research literature says otherwise. It's against order. And given that much of education policy seems to be following suit, it can even feel like the battle has already been lost. Consider the following excerpt uh, from a 2000 book, Where Mathematics Comes From. This is by a guy named George Lakoff and Rafael Nunez. This book has more than 4,500 Google Scholar citations. This is, this is central to the world of mathematics education research. In their intro, Lakoff and Nunez posit a romance of mathematics. And included in this romance, Oh, oh, sorry, going the wrong direction. Right. Included in this romance are the following claims. Mathematics has an objective existence, providing structure to this universe, independent of and transcending the existence of human beings. Mathematical proof allows us to discover transcendent truths of the universe. Mathematics is a part of the physical universe and provides rational structure to it. There are Fibonacci series and flowers, logarithmic spirals and snails, fractals and mountain ranges, parabolas and home runs, and pi in the spherical shape of stars, planets, and bubbles. Mathematics characterizes logic and thus structures reason itself. To learn mathematics is to learn the language of nature. Um, initially, I initially picked up this book on the recommendation from someone who I kind of thought was a friend. Uh, that's not true. I, I still think they're a friend. But, but I'm reading this and I'm kind of going, yes, yes, this is, this is great. And you can, you can probably see where this is going, right? The, 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 other, the other shoe is about to, about to drop here, right? Uh, and, and, and here it is. They continue. But the more we have applied what we know about cognitive science to understand the structure of mathematics, the more it has become clear that this romance cannot be true. Human mathematics, the only kind of mathematics that human beings know, cannot be a subspecies of abstract transcendent mathematics. Instead, it appears that mathematics as we know it arises from the nature of our brains and our embodied experience. As a consequence, every part of the romance appears to be false for reasons that we will be discussing. For these authors, and for most of the mathematics education research community, mathematics at its core is a cultural endeavor. 
Different people use it, talk about it, create it in different ways. This creates a mathematical pluralism in which one person's or one culture's conceptions of mathematics is just as valid as any others. And in the process, it destroys the idea that there is anything that is capital T true that underlies it. Reality is socially built, human creation, without any objectivity. And, and this is mathematics. If there was any subject you would potentially think is holding out some hope for truth, it would be math. Now, I'm not arguing that culture and history and people don't all have a part to play in the human doing of mathematics and science, right? I'm not arguing for some rigidly constraining objectivity that renders individual language and interpretation worthless. Relationships matter, context matter. But I've read an article about ethnomathematics that says that two plus two equals five is just as valid as two plus two equals four. And I've read an article about ethnoscience that says the idea that the moon causes tides is just as valid as the idea that a great sea turtle living, leaving its nest, allowing the water to flow back in, allows the tides to recede from the shore. Serious academic articles. There's a famous paper written by a guy named Paul Ernest in something like 1991, and he divides the prevailing epistemological and philosophical schools of thought into a dichotomy that he calls absolutism and fallibilism. And I think we can question whether or not that's a good dichotomy, but, but this has been accepted by academia and it's come down squarely on the side of fallibilism. We may dress it up with words like ethnoscience and social culturalism, but the idea remains prevalent there is no objective order that underlies reality and all knowledge is dependent upon human belief and opinion. There may be some little t truths for individuals, or even agreed upon by a group of people, but it has wholly dismissed the idea that there are any capital T truths that might be true for us all. And so here I think we might finally arrive at the reason why I'm here with you all today, is that we share a common purpose, specifically as teachers, students, and administrators within the classical education tradition, we share the purpose to recover the lost belief that the world is ordered, patterned, beautiful, full of capital T truths, and a source of insight into some of the most fundamental questions that all mankind has to face. I actually think this is one of the harder questions to deal with as classical educators, is uh, I think a lot of people conceive of classical education as this, I wish we lived back in 300 BC with Plato. I don't think that's what classical education means. Uh, I don't, I, I, like, I like my running water, thank you very much. Uh, but, but it is, in some ways, a recovery of something. Right? What are we trying to go back and recover? Right? And I think, the rec right, hopefully, we can keep our running water and modern conveniences and, and, and some of the great truths that we've learned over the past number of years. Um, but I think we want to re recover the world as objectively good, filled with big T truths and radiating universal beauty, something that is very clear the world as a whole has lost. Let me return to our quote one last time before I finally get into Annie Dillard here. But that second sentence of Augustine comes to mind here. To attain and retain this order, to open one's eyes and other people's to it is difficult and very uncommon. And I think this project, I think this is the project that I want to embark on you for a bit today. This is, in many ways, an educational vision. Right? Open one's eyes. That's a learning thing. And open others' eyes. This is a teaching thing. And I think it needs to be the shared vision that we have as teachers and students. We want to attain and retain the order inherent in the world, to catch a vision for the music of the spheres, to pursue it unceasingly, to battle against the forces that would destroy it, and finally, to educate others to do the same. That is our purpose. In some ways, this kind of sounds ridiculous. Students, maybe you come home from school one day and your mom asks, what'd you learn today, honey? Uh, at well, today I attained and retained the order of the cosmos. I opened my eyes, and I opened those around me to it, right? Uh, you know, my parents might send some emails to the administration. Um, but, but I think this needs to be the vision. This is why we're here, right? Uh, I used to, uh, when, I was, when I was a student, um, I, I remember this very clearly. I had a, I had a math teacher, and you know, someone asked, like, why do we learn mathematics? And the math teacher said, uh, what do you guys think, what do you, what, you know, you guys think you're going to carry around a, pocket, or a calculator and an encyclopedia in your pocket for the rest of your life? And I was like, yes, yes, I do think that. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going, I'm going to carry around a calculator and an encyclopedia in my pocket for the rest of my life, right? Uh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. This can't, it's not, that's not the reason why we learn. Right? It's 
not the acquisition of information, right? It's to see the world as an ordered whole and to embrace that vision, retain it in our lives. One of the best articulations of this project comes from a guy named Stratford Caldecott um, in his book, Beauty for Truth's Sake. If you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it, um, especially the intro and the conclusion. Um, but uh, in the book, he calls for a modern recasting of the liberal arts that recovers the traditional and the sacramental, reinfuses nature with grace, and re-embeds the spiritual into the cosmological. He's asking this within the context of modernity. He's writing in 2009, recognizing some of the progress that has been made while also recognizing the need for a recovery. He says... We need to reestablish a truly humane education that begins with the senses and the discovery and cultivation of harmony and beauty in the soul by way of the senses' natural affinity for the harmonious, proportionate, and the beautiful in nature and the arts. Sorry, going the wrong direction. This all-pervasive modern mentality is what we are up against in education as everywhere else. The Enlightenment is not something you can... Not something you can simply unthink. How are we to combat the negative effects of individualism without losing the benefits of self-consciousness and rationality? This question strikes at the heart of the modern classical education movement as it purposes a recovery of the traditional liberal arts that seeks to remain relevant in a 21st century world. Caldecott calls for, calls for us to relearn how to see. To not boil down the world to facts, formulas, and information, but to see it as alive sacramental, and filled with spiritual meaning. And so let's move toward the, act, toward the actual subject of the talk here, after that extensive intro. Um, again, I've entitled it, I am the Aeroshaft, Annie Dillard, Seeing, and Classical Pedagogy. So why Annie Dillard? Um, Augustine actually ends the same section in On Order with this fascinating line. Some cauterize the wound of disordered opinion inflicted on them in day-to-day -day life by retreating into solitude. Others do the same by cultivating the liberal arts. Fascinating. I, we could spend a lot of time on this line here, um, but I think it's safe to say that given our current presence here in this room together, uh, that we've all chosen one of these two paths, right? Uh, namely to cultivate the liberal arts. If, the, if there's some wandering hermits who happen to pop in, like, I, I apologize, right? You, you've chosen the retreat into solitude option. But I think it's, it's pretty safe to say we're all on the same page here. But what I want to try to do today is to look at a figure, Annie Dillard, who has chosen the opposite option, right? the retreating into solitude, and see what we can learn from her. Though a number of Dillard's books might be worth investigating, I've chosen to focus on her Pulitzer Prize winning Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, which is a memoir of sorts. She heads out for a year into the middle of the wilderness in Virginia and writes a book about all of her observations and musings about nature. Really, she is engaging in a learning how to see observing, hypothesizing, thinking about, explaining, and delighting in the natural world. She even writes a chapter in the book called merely Seeing. And it is this chapter most of the quotes in this talk are going to come from. So Dillard is seeking, like Augustine is ca calls us to, to find this order, to see truly the world and delve as deep as possible into the ordered bedrock that underlies it. She ventures out into the middle of the order, and as we shall see the chaos as well, and provides her with a clarity of sight and a vision, and I think Dillard functions here as an example of someone who's attempting to do what Augustine and Caldecott are calling us to do, reanimating the natural world as a source of knowledge, beauty, and love that is thus reinscribed by the human and divine. The world for Dillard is a deliberate gift, a revelation that engages not only our senses but also our souls, demanding that we refuse the temptation to possess or conquer nature, and instead we must seek to be moved by its mystery. The seeing she does is, in a sense, sacramental. And not unlike other sacraments, it involves struggle, risk, participation, vulnerability, and even an embrace of discord and violence. So my main questions are, one, how does Annie see? Two, how might that inform how we should see as non-hermit cultivators of the liberal arts? Three, how is any of this related to order, capital O? And four, what might we take away from this project of seeing that informs how we go about teaching and learning in a classical school? Let's start with the seeing question. I've picked seven moments from this chapter that I think do a pretty good job of characterizing this idea of seeing, and I hope that learning to see through her eyes can challenge us a little bit about how we might open our own eyes to the ordered whole of the world. 
Let me start with one that should be fairly familiar to us, especially as we think about some of the qualities uh, we want to see in ourselves. First, uh, seeing is a participatory pursuit. Here's Dillard. The secret of seeing is, then, the pearl of great price. I cannot cause light. The most I can do is try to put myself in the path of its beam. It is possible in deep space to sail on solar wind. Light, be it particle or wave, has force. You rig a giant sail and go. The secret of seeing is to sail on solar wind. Hone and spread your spirit till you yourself are a sail. Wetted, translucent, broadside to the merest puff. In other places, she uses the question of whether the tree that falls in the forest makes a sound or not, and she comes up with this beautiful conclusion. Beauty and grace are out there in the world, whether or not we will or sense them. And the goal of the seer is to try to be there. Involve oneself in the process of discovery, to participate in some real way. Look at that quote more, one more time. Hone and spread your spirit. I'm not exactly sure what she means by spread your spirit, uh, but I'm sure that for Dillard, this is a personal thing. To really see, you can't just read about it in a textbook or gather a bunch of facts and information or watch other people spread their spirits on YouTube. You have to, in some way, spread your own. Seeing is a participatory pursuit. This is why we read the great books. To put ourselves in the closest possible encounter with things that are worth seeing. When you open the texts or contemplate the great ideas, you are putting yourself in the path of the beam, of the light of cosmological order. Second, seeing is, as might be expected given the participatory nature of the pursuit, a disciplined struggle. Do it again. The effort of seeing is really a discipline requiring a lifetime of dedicated struggle. As with any pursuit, while there might be some initial talent or natural aptitude for the pursuit, at some point that talent, think about some passion that you have, that talent must be combined with serious study, training, and effort, all of which require self-discipline. When describing this need to discipline the self to see, Dillard uses even monastic language, comparing the singularity of focus that the seer requires to the singularity of focus in monastic communities. Just as the goal of monastic life is to systematically strip away all distractions and dedicate oneself fully to God, the goal of one who is committed to the task of seeing the divine order is to strip away all the, in Diller's words, trivia and trash that preclude one from seeing. Only by removing the distractions and making time and space for a consistent, dogged pursuit of the order in the world can one learn to see. It is not easy. For every story Dillard tells where she does see, she tells three or four where she struggles with not seeing. But like any good pursuit, improvement happens over the course of steady, regular self-discipline. I'm not here advocating for classical education to be hard for hard's sake. Rigor itself is not a good thing in and of itself. I repeat, teachers, rigor itself is not a good thing in and of itself. Joy must be present. But the reality is that it's hard to do calculus. It's hard to read Paradise Lost. It's way easier to read more fluffy books. But the, discipline, but the difficulty disciplines us to encounter the world, assuming that if we are willing to put in the effort to see, the world is full of beauty and revelation to be seen. Number three thinking about what might make this struggle a bit easier, seeing is an act of knowledge and of love. Seeing for Dillard is not a cold, dispassionate pursuit. Yes, it requires struggle, self-discipline, and it is certainly not easy, but it is enhanced by intimate knowledge and must be done out of love. She concludes, the lover can see and the knowledgeable. The point is that I just don't know what the lover knows. I can't see the artificial obvious that those in the know construct. Actually, actually uh, in the book, this is, this is one of the funniest moments in the book. She, she tells this story of, uh, she, I don't know how she got into this situation, but she was hanging out with a bunch of ranchers and they asked, uh, she, she was drawing a horse in front of them. And so she draws their like, uh, she draws a horse and they just laugh at her at, that like this is her conception of the horse and then, you know, she looks at, 
you know, they draw horses for some reason. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but, but they draw horses, and their horses are just immaculately drawn with detail. And the point is that they're around horses all the time. They love them. This is, and they're the ones that know how to draw. They're the ones that see horses, right? Uh, you, uh, if you have the one thing that you think you know incredibly well, and someone else comes and like gives it a cursory glance, right? You're like, no, you're not really seeing that thing. Right? It's only when we love and know the thing that we can see. Seeing is an intimate endeavor, and the more and more we come to understand the object of our sight, the more and more we become enamored of it, the better and more fully we shall see. The knowledge and love go hand in hand, as there is a real danger for knowledge without love to boil down the object into a set of facts and information, just as there is a real danger for love without knowledge to turn, into, to turn into pure eros, devoid of understanding. But hand in hand, knowledge and love can draw our attention to the nuances and details of a thing, helping provide the desire for the discipline and struggle and opening our eyes to the order and beauty around us. In Dillard's words, alluding perhaps to Peeper, it is my leisure as well as my work. None of these first three are perhaps surprising to us, Yes, we need to be personally participating. Yes, we need to develop good discipline habits. Yes, it helps if we know and love what we're seeing. But for Dillard, and I think this is why Dillard seems so relevant specifically to modernity, there is another dimension to seeing. And this is where we get into the second half of how she describes the work of the seer. Fourth, seeing is a letting go. Fascinating. There's a real temptation to take the first three aspects of seeing and turn it into something you can master like learning how to ride a bike or something. Let's discipline ourselves, let's break it down into its parts, let's follow the formula, let's practice it again and again until we figured it out. In many ways, it's a very human thing to do, and I'm not trying to devalue things like problem-solving skills or reasoning or even the scientific method, but that's, if that's all the ways that we ever see, Dillard says, we are missing out. She says, there is another kind of seeing that involves a letting go. Letting go of one's chair, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> uh, another kind of seeing that involves a letting go. Uh, launch into the deep, and you shall see. Dillard describes the difference between walking around with a camera, looking to capture the nuances and waiting patiently for the right thought, versus walking around without a camera. Letting go of the desire to cast, capture or master the world and submitting oneself to the beauty and mystery. The world is a living and active mystery, full of depths that can never be plumbed or captured. And although the attempt to plumb them is certainly worthwhile and valuable, stepping back, taking a wider view, and being in a way overwhelmed by the immensity of it all is a way of truly seeing. I think this letting go seeing is a real deficiency for any of us living in the 21st century, especially with the ever-present cameras on our phones, our desire to capture and remember moments, and desire to share them on social media. Just like that desire to capture and possess, we tend to shift our classroom instruction along similar lines and focus on mastery in the classroom. While I certainly want my students to master some things, I also want them to be mastered by things, to really see themselves as part of a larger whole, a larger order that's too immense to ever be fully comprehended. Take some time in your classrooms to let go, to wonder, to do things not because they will be on the test, but because they are explicitly not on any test. Launch yourself into the deep. Fifth, if seeing is a personal endeavor that involves the relinquishing of control and some sort of submission to an order, it stands to reason that seeing must be a risky endeavor. Dillard describes this risk in almost desperate sounding language, with something like a willingness to sacrifice everything just to see. Some days when a mist covers the mountains, when the muskrats won't show and the microscope's mirror shatters, I want to climb up the blank blue dome as a man would storm the inside of a circus tent, wildly dangling, and with a steel knife claw a rent in the top, peep, and if I must fall. In some ways, this is related to the idea of seeing as a disciplined struggle, but it goes beyond this. For Dillard, the order to be found is found amidst, within, and sometimes through the chaos, discord, and violence in the world, and thus it necessarily involves the vulnerable exposure to whatever we might see in nature, the good and peaceful, as well as the bad and discordant. 
Many of her stories and musings are couched within some disturbing scenes. Frogs sucked up by giant water bugs, sharks eating one another, cats killing mice, and leaving bloody footprints all over. She describes this as power and beauty, grace tangled in a rapture with violence. I think this is particularly relevant to classical education within modernity. Dillard is not arguing for some Victorian sense of order here. She's recognizing the mystery involved, the tough questions, the violence, the chaos, the failure, the darkness. She knows that purposing to see the sacramental in the world is not going to be easy or simple. That more times than not, we are going to come home discouraged and confused. But she thinks it is worthwhile anyways. This is how we must do classical education if it's to become real to us. Embrace the hard questions, the human questions, and still take the risk to launch ourselves into the deep in search of order. Like Lewis's beautiful description of Aslan, Learning is not safe, but it is good. Number six. There has to be a reward to such a risk that seeing is a gift and a surprise. Dillard often couples the failures she experiences with moments of unexpected revelation. In her words, the literature of illumination reveals this above all, although it comes to those who wait for it. It is always, even to the most practiced and adept, a gift and a total surprise. Never for Dillard does an experience of this order leave her feeling complacent or recycled. It is new every morning, and never does it fail to deliver shock, awe, and wonder. This gift-likeness of seeing is fascinating to ponder in conjunction with the disciplined nature of seeing. How do we develop the fusion of patience and hope, perseverance and freshness, action and being acted upon, self-control and creativity? It is at this intersection that we are able to see, pursuing and training ourselves to see, but also waiting and longing for a vision to be given to us anew out of the blue. We must walk around hands outstretched, constantly ready to receive the gift of sight. And I think, though admittedly this is me more than Dillard, ready to be thankful for such a gift. Seventhly and lastly, Dillard gives us, I think, the strangest picture of being seen, uh, of seeing, saying that seeing is less like seeing and more like being seen. Truly quite obscure, but perhaps a little context for the quote might help. One day, as I was walking along Tinker Creek, thinking of nothing at all, I saw a backyard cedar where the morning doves roost, charged and transfigured, each cell bussing with flame. It was less like seeing than being for the first time seen, knocked breathless by a powerful glance. Gradually, the lights went out in the cedar, the colors died, the cells unflamed and disappeared. I was still ringing. I had been my whole life a bell and never knew it until that, at that moment I was lifted and struck. For Dillard, this seeing demands a response. It demands the resonance of one's whole person, truly seeing the world, getting a glimpse of the patterns by which it spins, catching a few notes of the music of the spheres requires us as humans to see ourselves as spinning to that same pattern as dancing to that same song. When our eyes are open, not only do we see other things, but we experience ourselves as also part of that same wondrous order, and thus, in a way, vulnerable to being seen. And really, it's this last one that I think launches us into the discussion of what this means for us as teachers and as learners, what you might take away from this talk back into the classroom on Monday, let me try to answer that question by sharing a passage from Dillard that has been front and center to my thoughts about classical education for the past few years. It may initially seem a bit strange, but I think it's one of the best and most important articulations of what we are engaged in as classical teachers and students. This, this also haunts me um, in, 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 in the best way, if that's possible. Uh, here's Dillard. I walk out. I see something, some event that would otherwise have been utterly missed and lost, or something sees me. Some enormous power brushes me with its clean wing, and I resound like a beaten bell. And here we go. I am an explorer then, and I am also a stalker, or the instrument of the hunt itself. Certain Indians used to carve long grooves along the wooden shafts of their arrows. You see a picture there. They call these grooves lightning marks because they resembled the curved fissure lightning slices down the trunks of trees. The function of the lightning marks is this. If the arrow fails to kill the game, blood from a deep wound will channel along the lightning mark, streak down the arrow shaft, and splatter to the ground, laying a trail dipped on broad leaves on stones that the barefoot and trembling archer can follow 
into whatever deep or rare wilderness it leads. I am the arrow shaft. Notice it's not I am the hunter. I am the arrow shaft, carved along my length by unexpected lights and gashes from the very sky, and this book is my straying trail of blood. Dillard here is talking about writing, but she may as well be talking about teaching and learning. It is one of the strangest analogies you will ever hear about education, comparing a teacher or a student to an arrow shaft, but one that I can't get out of my head. The implications here, I think, are threefold. First, that the very first step before anything can take place, before we as arrows take our place in the quiver, we must first be formed and fashioned in a certain way, carved by a deep and violent engagement, like being struck by lightning, by the world around us. Becoming fit for teaching is having been already carved, having launched oneself first into the deep of the world and becoming imprinted and transformed yourself with the pattern and order of that world. Teachers, teaching begins by being marked, shaped, and formed yourself with what is true and good. It is recognizable on your skin as a real, physical, tangible, never-to-be-changed way. And for students, learning means feeling yourself being carved in the classroom. This would be another hilarious thing to tell your mom when she asks you how your day was at school, right? <laughs> Today, mom, the material carved itself into me. I have long, deep grooves in my being, right? This is <laughs> Administrators are going to get some hilarious emails. <laughs> But I think learning something new must necessarily transform us. It must leave its mark upon us. Students, seek to be marked in some way by what you are learning. Look for the ways that every text imprints itself upon you. Second, this is mostly for teachers, but the act of teaching begins with the moment of launching the arrow. Remember, the arrow is yourself. Launching yourself, a singular moment that is active, personal, participatory, and even violent, the arrow is carved for a purpose, for a singular moment in which it is launched toward the natural world and pierces it in some way. Launched toward a text, piercing it in some way. Obviously, I'm not encouraging violence in the classroom, but teaching must be the seeking out of a moment where the teacher actively, vulnerably, and personally strikes out into the world in front of their students. And thirdly, this one is mostly for students, the act of learning requires the willingness to follow one's quarry wherever it leads. Teaching requires the leaving of a trail, a trail that is in some way now outside of the teacher's control. Students, it is for you to follow, moving deeper and deeper into the unknown parts of the forest, doggedly clinging to the object of your study so that the trail might be plain for others to follow. This image is, I think, tremendously powerful, but perhaps still a bit obscure. So to be really explicit and practical, I think the implications here for teaching and learning are threefold. And as you re-enter your classrooms on Monday and for the rest of the year, I would humbly offer the following three recommendations, just thinking along the same lines that Annie Dillard is pointing us to. First, we need to, all of us, teachers and students, reopen ourselves up to seeing the world afresh. We must take seriously the challenge that Dillard puts for us to be the arrow shaft, to embody the order of the world, to continue to see anew in all the seven dimensions that Dillard calls us to. This should not surprise us. It's one of the hallmarks of classical education. The teacher is not just a skilled methodologist with a toolbox full of pedagogical strategies and techniques. The teacher continuously pursues their discipline. And the student is just not an intaker of information uh, but the student is a participant in the act of learning. Banner and Cannon in the Elements of Teaching say that the very first quality required of a teacher is the desire to continue learning. Above all, teaching requires learning itself. And if possible, under the demanding conditions that face so many teachers, it requires mastery of a subject. To possess and master knowledge, one must wrestle with it constantly, fashioning and refashioning what one knows and how to present it. Knowledge taunts us with its difficulty, its incompleteness, its ambiguity. It is no simple feat to continue to launch oneself into the deep. And it tends to be one of the first things that goes by the wayside when homework and college applications and letters of recommendations and sports and grading and lesson planning and other things about teaching and learning overwhelm us. But by taking seriously Dillard's challenge to animate our knowledge afresh by re-immersing ourselves, not just in the familiar, but in the newness to be found in the discipline is the thing that shapes us as teachers and students within classical education. Recall one more time 
Augustine's charge. We must attain and retain this order and open our eyes to the world around us before we can begin to open others' eyes. Secondly, the arrow shaft is launched in a single moment. And thus, as teachers and students, we need to look for those moments in the classroom that pierce the world in some way. We need to look for moments which we are brought face to face with some experience that reveals the order of the world, that provides occasion for us to encounter revelation, that puts us inside of the order of the cosmos. Most of the time, these moments take the form of an observation mixed with a question. Attending to some phenomena and then asking, what do we see? Why is it important? How does it work? Why does it make sense? How does it fit in with the other things? What implications does it have? What relationships does it have? How might we figure out what's going on? What patterns do you see? What's the key to understanding what is happening? What if it were a little bit different? What is unique about this scenario? Does this happen all the time? What might be an alternative explanation? What are the consequences of X, Y, and Z? When we think about the Socratic method, that's what we mean. We mean thinking about those questions. Hans Urs von Balthasar says that the whole world is fruitful for these questions. The whole world of the images that surrounds us is a signal, single field of signification. Every flower we see is an expression. Every landscape has its significance. Every human or animal face speaks its wordless language. This expressive language is addressed primarily not to conceptual thought, that, but to the kind of intelligence that perceptively reads the gestalt of all things. Each thing we purpose to teach and learn is part of the large whole of the world, and thus each one presents the opportunity. Teachers, get students wondering about it, encountering the world afresh, asking them questions. Students, when your teachers ask you a question, ponder it. They aren't testing you. They're giving you the impetus to pierce the world on your own. Again, think of Augustine. Maybe they are testing you. Uh, they shouldn't be. Uh, well, kind of. They're giving you an opportunity. Uh, again, think of Augustine. If this world is within and between everything, each phenomenon in the world is charged with meaning down to its smallest part as an integral part of an ordered whole and a potential source of revelation. Look for the moments of revelation in your classes. Thirdly, we need to be willing to follow those questions wherever they lead. The temptation after bringing students to a moment in which they might see is for teachers to try to control their students' seeing. It's an understandable temptation. The moment makes you see, and you care for your students, and you want them to see what you see. And the opposite temptation is equally uh, tempting to let them respond however they want with no guidance whatsoever. But for there to be any authentic seeing on the part of students, they need to be the ones to follow the trail that you leave. You don't get to control where your quarry goes after you strike it with the arrow. And you don't get to control exactly where the conversation or discussion goes after you pose the questions. You try to do so, you choke the life out of it, and you eliminate the student's chance to have a real pursuit of the idea. Here's Paul Lockhart talking about mathematics. If you deny students the opportunity to engage in the activity of mathematics, to pose their own questions, to make their own conjectures and discoveries, to be wrong, to be creatively frustrated, to have an inspiration, and to cobble together their own explanations and proofs, you deny them mathematics itself. This, in many ways, is the fun part about teaching. The open-mindedness, the chase, the unknown, the new. To lose this is to turn teaching into just a transmission of what has already been figured out. Lockhart, in another place, makes an important distinction between mathematics, the discovering and beholding of the explanations behind universe phenomena, and the results of mathematics, the discoveries boiled down to their most explicit and efficient form. This is not some classroom free-for-all where every idea is as good as every other one, but it's a genuine hunt for order, beginning with an unknown question, and only after a full and true dialogue that questions or about that question that twists and turns through different ideas and arrival at an answer. Teachers, turn your students loose. Students, run wild. Try on ideas. Throw out thoughts to discuss. Ask questions. Write papers that don't just rehash what's been said in class, but strike out in new directions. Don't be afraid to be wrong. Think deeply about the things you learn. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And help one another in this endeavor. This is not a solitary hunt, but one that is done in a community of hunters. The best classes that I have taught, the ones that have developed the deepest friendships, are the ones that are willing to run wild with one another, that aren't afraid of throwing out ideas. 
At its heart, these recommendations are to follow in Dillard's footsteps, seeking to move our students in the same way that we are moved by her writing. She is truly right in writing Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, undertaking a pilgrimage. She journeys to seek answers to questions rooted in the modern milieu by revisiting ideas of the past and reanimating the present with those ideas. Following her example, we as classical teachers and students must undertake a similar journey. Encountering the surrounding world, seeing the entangled beauty and violence, grace and chaos, order and disorder, and being captivated, carved, and pierced by that vision in such a way that those around us cannot help but see a trail that leads to a pilgrimage of their own. Here's Dillard one last time, a poem called Mornings Like This. Sunday, what still sunny days we have now, and I alone in them, so brief, our best. So much is wrong, but not my hills. I've been thinking of writing a letter to the president of China. Do it, do it, do it, do it. I beseech you, I beseech you, I beseech you, I beseech you. Mornings like this, I look about the earth and the heavens. There is not enough to believe. Mornings like this, how heady the morning air, how sharp and clear the morning air. Authentic winter, the order of campfires, beans 18 inches long, a billion chances, and I am here. And here I lie in the quiet room and read and read and read, so easy, so easy, so easy, pools in the old woods, full of leaves. Give me time enough in this place, and I will surely make a beautiful thing. Thank you all. I'll take a couple questions if there's time. Maybe one. <laughs> Have you ever had one of those lightning moments? <laughs> it's a real personal question. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, but also I think sometimes uh, carving doesn't happen all in a moment. Um, carving, you know, being carved by something, um, kind of, if you think about, man, uh, you know, imagine you're, even you're like you're folding a piece of paper, right? Uh, you tend to fold it a couple of times in different ways to really get a crease in it right? And the carving of something I think is kind of similar. Like if you were going to really carve it, usually there's some initial moment that sparks it, uh, kind of the first, the first cut of the knife perhaps. Uh, but really I think carving a lot of times happens uh, over and over and over again, right? You go and you pursue it a little bit more deeply and you think about it a little more deeply. And you have maybe that initial moment where, where I think it's, it can be, you know, have you ever read something and you're just like, Yes, this is it, right? Um, and, and, and you almost can't, it's, it's, I mean, one of the carving moments was actually me reading this on order, like, moment for us, right? I, I was carved by that, but it's, it's the repetition over and over about thinking about that that I think really tends to embed it uh, and imprint it upon us. Um, and so when you have something that sparks your interest, um, not just kind of leaving it, but returning over and over again to thinking about it and, you know, sharing it with other people and talking about it. Hey, what do you think about this? Like, I think that's, you're right, it is a moment, but I think it's also a, a repetition of moments. Um, yeah, uh, great question. <laughs> 